Hi, and I welcome to this second video on cluster analysis. In this video, we're going to look in particular at k-means clustering. So as we talked about in the previous video, it's not always clear exactly how you should choose your clusters in cluster analysis, right? But the main idea is that you would like to have points in the same cluster should be similar and points in different clusters should be dissimilar for whatever similar means. So in some sense, we have these two different pictures of these two different clusterings of the same set of points, right? We by far prefer the left one or the right one in some sense. At least just looking at them as humans, it seems that the left picture over there is the right clustering of the points. So in k-means, uh, this is basically a concrete way of choosing how we should cluster our data. <clears throat> In some sense, k-means provides a measure of how good a clustering is, and this measure ensures that we will prefer the left clustering over there or the right clustering uh, on this picture here. Okay. So k-means clustering. So in k-means clustering, our, we're given this k. This is part of the input, or this is what you choose when you run the algorithm. So this is something you have to decide on when calling the algorithm a hyperparameter in some sense, right? So k is the number of clusters that you would like to construct. Now, for k-means clustering, the data is d-dimensional feature vectors, so points, right? So they're just points. Right? So we don't have any categorical features. That it's all just numerical values. And it is best for k-means clustering that the data is scaled such that the different coordinates of your feature vectors have roughly the same magnitude. Maybe this can be ensured by some reasonable scaling of the input first, uh, but this is just um, to make sure that no coordinates are kind of preferred or more important than, than others. Okay. Now, in, as we talked about in the previous video, some or many clustering algorithms are prototype based, meaning that there will be some kind of representative of each of the clusters. And this is also the case for k-means clustering. Here, each of these k clusters that we will construct will be represented by a prototype, which we call the cluster center. So in this small example here, these two special points that I drew here in light blue and light red, they will be the cluster centers of the blue and red clusters respectively. And it's important to note that these cluster centers that are being constructed in k-means clustering are not necessarily uh, a part of the input. They can be arbitrarily d-dimensional points. So in k-means clustering, the way that we define what is a good clustering is by minimizing a loss function. So the basic idea or the goal in k-means clustering is to choose k centers, which we call c1 to ck. And these centers should minimize the following loss on a data set S. So S here is all the points that we have as input. So the cost on uh, this data set S with these centers C is you sum over all the points in your data set then you look at the minimum overall cluster centers of the distance between uh, your point X and the cluster center squared. So let me just recall you here that the squared distance between two, two points, or two vectors, is just the sum over all the D coordinates of the square of the difference between uh, the two values of those coordinates, right? So the sum over I, XI minus YI squared. Okay, so in some sense, this cost here is a kind of least squared loss, if you will. It looks very similar to the least squared loss function in, in the sense that every point X in your data set is going to pay the squared Euclidean distance to its nearest center in the, the set of center C. And the goal now is to choose the set of center C that minimizes this loss, right, where every point is as close as possible or the sum of the squared distances to these centers is minimized. That's the k-means clustering goal. Okay, now the cost here, if you want to look at it visually, once I've chosen these centers here, you can see that the that for every single point, we're going to paste something to, to the sum. And what we're going to pay is going to be the distance to the nearest center. So the length of these line segments, but squared. So the square of all the lengths of these line segments, that's the cost of the quality, of the loss of this particular clustering. Okay. And once we have these cluster centers chosen, uh, we can say that cluster I consists of those points whose closest center is CI, right? So that's how we, we partition our points into the clusters, right? So, so that's why all the points on the left are blue, all the points on the right are red. These are the ones, the red points are the one that are, ones that are closest to this red center. 
right? So cluster I are those point, points that are closest to sender CI. Okay, good. So this is the goal in k-means clustering. Now the question is, of course, how do we solve this optimization problem, right? How do we compute these senders uh, to perhaps optimally minimize this loss, right? Is it can we find an algorithm for computing C1 to CK that minimizes this loss perfectly, like finds the optimal choice of senders? Now, unfortunately, this is known to be an NP hard optimization problem, even if the, your points only have two features. Okay, even in two-dimensional space, it's an NP-hard optimization problem to compute the optimal set of senders. Right, so, so that's not so great. It means that we're probably not going to find a fast enough algorithm for doing this if we want to find the optimal clustering. So therefore, uh, we're going to turn to heuristics. So we're going to look at algorithms that don't really have any provable guarantees, but that seem to work well in practice. Okay, so this is what we'll be looking at here. Good. So... To kind of motivate this heuristic that we'll see, uh, let's start to start by trying to make some observations about clustering, some useful observations. So think of what we're doing now in the next couple of, uh, of slides as, as just building up some intuition for what this heuristic should look like. Okay. So to build up intuition for this heuristic that we're going to see, let's try to generalize this notion of clustering a little bit. So let's say I've chosen a set of centers. C, like the ones that I have here in the picture, right? The two centers, this uh, this light blue center and this light red center. And let's say that we have an assignment pi. So pi is some mapping that assigns every point to a center. Okay, so pi of x, every point is mapped to a center by this assignment pi. And here we're going to say, okay, I'm not going to focus on only the assignments that map every uh, point to the nearest Center. We're just going to look at all possible assignments. Right? It could be an arbitrary assignment. Every point is just mapped to one of the senders. Okay. Now, if I have such a mapping, for instance, this one here, here's a mapping pi. Every point is, is assigned to the sender where this uh, line segment goes to. Right. So it's not necessarily the case that I'm going to map every point to its nearest center. I'm just going to look at arbitrary assignments. Okay. Now, if I have such an assignment, I can look at its cost. Right. What is the cost of clustering uh, the set of points S using the center C using the assignment pi? So here what I the cost is, of course, I sum over all my points, and then I measure the distance between my point X and the center that it is assigned to squared. Right. So it's just the sum of squares of all these line segment lengths in this picture up here. And so this is a kind of generalization where you don't necessarily insist on points being mapped to the nearest center. And the reason why we look at this generalization, even though it seems kind of silly to map points to faraway centers, is that it's going to motivate this algorithm or heuristic that we're going to see. Okay, so, so let's for now work with arbitrary assignments, of points to centers. Okay, so, so really, if we wanted to color things here based on this assignment pi, you can see that all the ones that are assigned to the red center here uh, will be colored red, and all the ones that are assigned to the blue center will be colored blue, right? So we have these blue points over here that are colored blue as well, even though they are actually closer to the red center. Okay. Now, okay, so let's say we have already decided on what our centers should be. So this, this is just like an easy subproblem that we want to, to understand, and then we can use this later on again to build our heuristic. So let's say I have already decided that these are the two senders I want to use. Which assignment then uh, will minimize the cost? Right. So I have fixed my center C. I know my data set is also fixed. That is, that is S. What assignment pi minimizes the cost? Right. So what should I choose these pi's to be? Now, this question is, you, know, you might be thinking, right, isn't this trivial? And of course it is, right? Every point should be mapped to its closest center, right? That's completely trivial. So if I've already decided on the centers, I should, of course, map every single point with my assignment pi to the nearest center. Okay. So it's just very easy and trivial, right? So that's completely obvious. But we will be using this observation nonetheless. That's why uh, we're highlighting it now. Okay. Uh, so then let's say, okay, are there any other easy cases or, or things to, that we can observe? Okay. So let's try to look at another... Thing here okay let's say we've had instead of having decided on what the senders should be let's say we have decided on what the assignments should be 
So having decided on an assignment without having decided on the centers, this just means I have decided which points belong to the same cluster. Okay, so I'm saying that, oh, all these points belong to the red cluster, all these points belong to the blue cluster. Okay, so this is what I have decided already, but I have not yet decided on what my center should be. Okay, if I have decided on, on who should be in the same clusters, what is the right choice of centers then? Like which centers should I choose? Of course, I should choose the centers that minimizes the cost, right? I already have my pi. Now pi is fixed, s is fixed. It's the c here I'm looking at, right? How should I choose my set of centers to minimize this cost, right? Well, the cost is just the sum of all the points, the square distance to whatever cluster center uh, I'm assigned to, the square of all these distances. So let us try to expand this cost a little bit to try and get some intuition on how we should choose these centers. So if I write out the cost, right, it, it, it's just the sum of all points, the square distance to this, uh, the center that it's assigned to. And what I can do with this sum is I can split it into a double sum. I can first sum over all the centers Noticing here that I haven't decided on where to place them yet, right? There's still variables, if you will, but but uh, I have one center for every cluster, right? So I have a red center and a blue center. So I can sum over the red center and the blue center. And then I have already decided on which points belong to the center, right? So I'm going to sum over all the points X who is mapped to center I, okay? So the cost is, of course, I sum over all the clusters. I sum over all the points in the clusters in that cluster, of the square distance to its center. Right? So this is just a rewriting. I'm just splitting this sum into like a double sum, summing first over the different clusters, then over the points inside of that cluster. Okay. So what we observe here is that, well, now the cost has really been written as um, basically a sum of all the clusters of the individual contributions from each cluster. Right? So basically we have one term for each cluster that contributes to the cost. And what we also see is if we look at this inner sum here, this the value here, well, it basically only depends on the center CI that we choose and, well, the points that are mapped that belong to this cluster, right? Everything else can be ignored. It's just uh, basically all the red points. That's, that's the only ones we need to worry about and what center we choose for the red points. This is all the contribution we get from the red part of the sum. Okay. So, so what this really means is that in some sense, we can focus on choosing each of these centers separately. You know, we can just look at, if we know that these are the points that are the red cluster, these are the points that are the blue cluster, we just focus on all the red points and choose their center. We focus on all the blue points and choose their center, right? This is quite obvious that we can do this. So, so let's try to do that. Let's say now we focus on all the red points. We already decided these red points should go together in a, to form a cluster. Okay. Now, all that remains now is to choose the center to minimize the contribution to the, to the cost from this cluster, right? So the contribution to the cost from this cluster is just the sum of all these red points, the ones in the cluster, of the square distance to the center that we're going to choose. So now we just have to choose this CI to minimize the sum of squares. Okay, so how can we do this? Now, we can again expand this cost so here, the cost, the contribution to the cost is again, the sum of the square distances. If you write out what the square distance is, just using the definition of square Euclidean distance, it's the sum over all the coordinates, the D different coordinates of your points, of the, the difference between the jth coordinate of X and the jth coordinate of the center squared. Okay. And now what we observe here is that we can swap the order of summation. So now it's the sum over the coordinates, the sum over all the points in the all the red points here of this squared difference between the center that we choose in this jth coordinate and the jth coordinate of, coordinate of x squared. So let's say now we just want to choose the jth coordinate of the center. And I just want to choose this jth coordinate. So, so basically we can see here again, this sum here, it basically splits it up to something that only depends on the jth coordinate for every j. So we can kind of choose the jth coordinate of the center each in isolation just to minimize the contribution to this sum. And so we can really just focus on how do I choose the jth coordinate of the center. And I should choose the jth coordinate of the center to minimize this sum of squares where the sum of squares is the difference between jth coordinate of my points and the jth coordinate of the center. 
But this is something that we've seen earlier on in previous videos. If I want to minimize the sum of squares, this is something that we saw uh, several times in the past. If I want to minimize the sum of squares, where this, it's the sum of the square difference from some value, then this co jth coordinate, the minimizer for this expression, the sum of square differences to, to the jth coordinate, is just the mean. Right? You, can, you can see this by just uh, computing derivatives and looking at it. It's not too hard to, to prove. So the minimizer for, for the jth coordinate is I should choose the jth coordinate of my center as the mean of all the jth coordinates of my points, all the red points here that I'm looking at, the ones that go into this cluster. So every coordinate is just the mean of the corresponding coordinates of the same coordinate in, in this cluster. Okay, but this holds for every coordinate j. So in particular, you can say that the whole center should just be the mean of the points in this cluster, right? So it's just the average over all the points of whatever that feature vector is. So, so the mean here is the minimizer for this cluster center. So, so here, the mean is this point over here, right? It's the mean across the x coordinates. So it's, there are more points over here. So it's leaning a little bit towards the side and the mean over the y coordinates as well. So this should is the optimal choice of center if I have already decided that these red points, they belong together. So now the contribution to the loss is the sum of squared distances to this point. And this is also, as you might be able to guess, right, this is the reason why this algorithm of heuristic or, the, or this problem is called uh, k-means clustering, right? You have to choose k-means of points inside your cluster that will minimize it. Okay. So if we step back to now when we have this arbitrary uh, partitioning of points into different clusters, we know that for every single cluster, the cluster center we should use is the mean of the points in that cluster. So for every cluster, we should use the mean, right? So which means that here's the mean from before, the red mean, and here is the blue mean, the mean of the blue points in that cluster. Okay, so that's nice. Now we know that for this concrete assignment pi, these are the best possible choices of uh, cluster centers. And you can see that the total contribution to this cost is the sum of the squares of all these line segment lengths. Okay. But staring at this picture, right, it's obvious that we can do better. We can reduce the cost significantly, right? So if we look again at this particular clustering, right, we already computed, well, this is the blue center, this is the red center for this concrete assignment pi. Now it's obvious that uh, if we wanna, if we've already decided on the centers, right? This is something we looked at earlier, right? If I already have decided on the centers, in this case, the, the, uh, the blue center and the red center and I want to minimize the cost by choosing a new assignment, I should assign every point to its closest center. All right. So, so first I had one partitioning of the points and I computed some centers based on that. But these centers now I can use to find a new assignment. Right? So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take these new centers that I just computed from my initial partitioning or assignment. I can compute a new assignment based on these. Right? I should always, to minimize the cost, I should assign every point to its closest center. So if I do that, my points are now assigned like this. So now I have this, this blue center, this red center, and the, all these points are assigned to this center and all these points are assigned to that center. Okay, so we improve the clustering uh, by doing this. But we can again improve, right? Now, what we have seen, seen here, right, is now I have decided on a new assignment. I have an assignment. And once I have an assignment, right, if we already decided on an assignment, then we also know what are the best choices of centers namely the means inside every cluster, right? So I already decided now that these blue ones go together, these red ones go together. So now I should replace these centers by the means of these blue points and the mean of these red points. So I should move the centers here. Okay, now I would, if I would con to continue this approach of going back and forth, I would try to say, okay, now I'm going to assign every point to its closest center. They are actually already assigned to their closest center. So nothing will change. So, so this process has converged in some sense. Okay, so now we build some intuition and let's try to use it like to come up with a final heuristic. So this heuristic that we're going to, to uh, describe is called Lloyd's algorithm. It's basically the most famous k-means algorithm or heuristic. And it's even so famous that it's often just called the k-means algorithm. 
I think that's misleading because there are many other algorithms that solve the K-means uh, clustering problem as we should distinguish the algorithm from the problem, right? So Lloyd's algorithm uh, is what we'll call it here. So let's say I have a set of points here and I want to cluster them into three clusters. Then Lloyd's algorithm is going to do the same following. So it has a first step here where you pick K random input points and let uh, the senders be, basically you put a sender on top of those points. And then you have a step where you repeat until convergence, assign every point to the closest center. And then afterwards you replace the set of senders by the means of the current clusters. So let's try to have a look at this. So the first step is to pick K random input points and put a center on top of them. So maybe it could look like this, right? I pick, if I'm going to partition into three clusters, I might randomly choose these three points and put a center on top of them. Okay. What does the algorithm say? It says assign every point to its closest center. Right. So this would look like this. So all these points here are closest to the red center. All these points are close to the blue center. All these points are closest to the green center. Okay. Next step is, well, we know the cost will improve if we replace the set of centers by the means of the corresponding clusters. All right. So now I want going to replace these centers by the, the red centers will be replaced by the mean of all the red points. The blue center will be replaced by the mean of the blue points and the green center will be replaced by the mean of the green points. So this is what happened here. These centers move a little bit. And remember there was an original data point underneath these centers. So the red one moved a little bit further here. The green one moved up there. The blue one moved down here. Okay. And then I just repeat. So now I have a new set of centers. So of course I should assign every point to the closest center to make the cost smaller. And you know you can see here that, for instance, this red center moved away. So now some of the points are closer to the green center up here. So, so the clustering changes and the cost decreases basically because we're always doing something that makes the cost better. Okay, so now we reassigned uh, the points to the, to the centers. Then we go back, we alternate this step. Now we're going to replace the centers by the means of the corresponding clusters. But we move some points away from the red cluster into the green cluster, right? And some blue points and so on. So, so the centers are going to move a little bit. Now we have new cluster centers that are now the means of the current points. And we repeat again, assign every point to its closest center. And so this might change a little bit, right? One point became uh, red down here, one became green up there, it didn't change much. And well, it changed a little bit, right? So we should also replace the, all of these means, uh, the centers by the means, they will change a little bit. So they're moving around. Uh, we have a new set of, of centers, right? So we should again, try to assign every point to its closest center. Some of the points got eaten by the red center down there instead of the blue center. We repeat, replace the centers by the means. The blue center is gonna move further to the right. The red one's gonna move a little bit to the right as well. And this time, then every point is actually closest to uh, the center it's already assigned to by this coloring. So now we the, this algorithm has converged and this is the final clustering. Right. So this is what Lloyd's algorithm is doing, right? It's just repeating these two steps that we gained intuition from, and just keep on repeating them until we have a, until it converges and nothing changes anymore. Okay. This is Lloyd's algorithm. So what can we say about Lloyd's algorithm? Right. So uh, basically, one can. It's quite easy to argue that it always converges, and the reason is that every time we make a change we're going to reduce the cost, right? We're always gonna choose something that's optimal, a new placement of the centers that's optimal uh, if I've decided on the on the partitioning, on the assignment, or we're gonna uh, change, choose the assignment that's optimal for the given center. So we're always going to reduce the cost with every step and it can never go to, it can never keep reducing for an uh, arbitrarily long time. You can show this as well. Okay, good. Now, one thing that is a bit of a downside with this algorithm is that the quality of the final clustering will depend on the initial clusters that we choose. And, um, and maybe it's not clear here from this picture, this animation that we just did, but it's not always the case that Lloyd's algorithm is going to find an optimal clustering. So let's try to look at an example. Uh, basically, this example is going to show that the clustering that we end up with can be arbitrarily bad, depending on what the data set looks like. So let's look at a really simple data set. There are only four points. You have two points to the far right, two point, points to the far left, and we're going to uh, find a partitioning into two clusters. 
let's say that the coordinates are such that the difference here on the x-axis is two times some number w, the thing of w is something really large, and on the y-axis, it's just two. Okay. Now, it's not too hard to see that the optimal clustering is to put one sender over here and one sender over here, and right in the middle between these two points and right in the middle between these two points, right? Because then every point is within a distance of one from its closest center. So the sum of squared distances is, is four, right? Everyone computes, contributes one squared for a total cost of four for this clustering here. Okay, so that's the optimal clustering. Now let's try to run Lloyd's algorithm, right? And let's see that we can actually be unlucky. So pick K random input points uh, as your initial cluster centers. So maybe with probability one half, right? You will pick two points on the same side, like it's shown down here. So you pick maybe a point up here and a point up there. So what happens now if we execute Lloyd's algorithm? So every point is assigned to the closest center. Now, if we look at these points, well, this point over here is closest to the red center. This point here is closest to the blue center. So they will be assigned like this. So this is assigned to red, this is assigned to blue. And there's also a point underneath here uh, that is also assigned to this center. Now we should replace the set of senders by the means of the clusters, right? So we should take the mean of the two red points up here, the mean of the two blue points, and we should put the centers here in the middle. And so this is the red center, this is the blue center. And now everything is converged, right? This point is still closer to the red center. This is close to the red center. This is close to the blue center. This is close to the blue center. So nothing changes. And what is the cost of this clustering? Well, you can see here that this red point is within a distance of W from the, uh, from the center. This is the same for this point. This is also within distance W, and this is within distance W. So we have four points all contributing W squared to the cost. And so as you can see here, the clustering that Lloyd's algorithm finds cost a factor W squared more than the optimal clustering, right? And W is just some uh, parameter of the input, like how scale stretched out was this input, right? So it can really be arbitrarily bad if your data set is arbitrarily nasty. So, so that's the downside of Lloyd's algorithm. Uh, you can also, so, so basically the quality of the clustering that you find depends on the initialization. People often run with, uh, several executions with different random initializations and pick the best clustering that you find, right? You can just measure the cost of the final clustering. Uh, another thing that has been shown theoretically is that on some inputs, uh, the number of steps that you need to, to execute for, of Lloyd's algorithm can actually be exponential in the number of points. This is not typically what you see in practice, but you can construct cooked up examples where this is the case. Okay, so for this reason, sometimes you include a termination or early stopping criterion in Lloyd's algorithm. And it's basically saying, okay, if I run the algorithm and my improvements are so small with every step, uh, then I should just stop. So epsilon could be some user specifiable parameter. Maybe you say 1%, and then you, you'd say, well, I'm going to repeat this loop until the new cost I have after doing a, an iteration of the loop where I, I change the assignment and I change the centers. If the new cost divided by the old cost is at least one minus epsilon, for instance, right? So you, you don't really decrease by much. It's almost the same cost as before. Uh, then you can break out of your loop if you suddenly don't see any improvements anymore. So that's a practical uh, optimization you could, you could do if you're worried about running your algorithm for too long. Good. So there'll be one more video where we'll talk about an improvement or an idea to, to improve this Lloyd's algorithm.